Thank you guys. Grab a seat. Most reliable way to quiet a room is to start praying. So just so you're not caught off guard by that, that's what I'm about to do. And I'm actually going to pray and we'll start our meeting. Okay. Father, thank you for Atlanta Westside. Thank you for the common life you have given us together. Please use this meeting to make us more like you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So, welcome to the meeting. You don't have to be a member if you want to sit in and check it out. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, I'll share the, um, the agenda we've got here. Did that, okay. Two main things, celebration and information. We look for a catchier word than information, but that's what it is. So uh, we're going to share new staff. Up here we have uh, Megan Penland, who is one of our staff members, uh, Lauren Johnson and Chris LaCroix, um, diaconal member, ministry team members over the finance team. They're going to be specifically handling the finance portion of things. Uh, I'm just going to start, go real quickly through some of this information. We just want to make sure you all know what's going on. Since this time last year, we've got a bunch of new staff. So let's go to the next slide. White Brown came last fall as our boys coordinator part-time. He also flies planes, which is cool. Uh, Mamie Williams came in January. has been a huge help. If you've ever come into the office side during co-working during the week, Mamie's uh, desk is right up front there. Stephanie Holby, in the absence of, we haven't been able to hire our kind of a long-term, full-time uh, kids director. Stephanie is a veteran in the field and has offered her services as an interim for us, and she's a pro. We're so grateful for her. Uh, Ray just came in August, last month, and huge help. Yes, where's Ray? Somewhere in here. Also a pro uh, here on the weekend installing hardware so that our live stream could go back up. Some of you might have noticed it totally crashed last here, Josh Kim, I'm going to talk more about in a moment as our new assistant pastor for care. Lynn Cook, there's Lynn. What, raise your hand if you don't know Lynn. So Lynn just started this month as our director of outreach and mission, and she's actually having a lot to do with the conferences coming up this coming weekend. Uh, we're super excited about the work that she's doing, coordinating uh, our efforts beyond the church walls. And then London also, just in the last couple of weeks, has come on as a part-time girls coordinator for student ministries. So we're super thankful to have them all on board. And I said this to our, our elders and our DMT members th this week. Um, it just feels like a shot in the arm. These are, these are godly, capable people, and our staff is really in a great place right now. So I'm celebrating that. Uh, next slide, new church leader candidates. This, we're not going to give you names. Just, just All you get is numbers. But back in the spring, you all as a congregation nominated people for elder diaconal ministry team, and women's council. And out of the people that were vetted and nominated, that's the number of people that have said, I would like to start training and consider whether I would go forward. So elders will eventually be elected sometime in the spring, and then we will commission the DMT and the women's council in the spring as well. The women's council is new, so you may have questions about that later on, but we're excited that that many men and women have agreed to serve in these leadership roles going forward. Also, uh, Josh, I believe Josh is up next. We have to install Josh. And in the past, we have done this. This is to fill all Presbyterian righteousness. Come on up here, Josh. Um, we have done this in the middle of service, and it's just kind of um, a little bit boring in the middle of a worship service, so we're making it boring here. And I'm going to try to make it a little more interesting as well. So... Um, Josh has been a pastor for many years, and he's already ordained, but in order to come and be a pastor here, he had to meet with representatives of our presbytery, which is a group of representative elders in the metro Atlanta region. He had to take another test, long, many years in seminary. He had to get a, have an oral exam, and he had to stand. It was actually here on this floor in, uh, a few months ago and defend his views, and he passed. Here's, what, here's the good thing about that, not just that he's a smart guy, but that he's accountable, and that anyone in a position of pastoral leadership is accountable beyond this room, and, and we need that. So I've got uh, three questions to ask you, Josh. This is from our book of church order. Are you now willing to serve this congregation as their assistant pastor, agreeable to your declaration in accepting its call? Are you? And do you conscientiously believe and declare, as far as you know your own heart, 
that in taking upon you this charge, you were influenced by a sincere desire to promote the glory of God and the good of his church. Do you? And do you solemnly promise that by the assistance of the grace of God, you will endeavor faithfully to discharge all the duties of a pastor to this congregation and will be careful to maintain in all respects becoming a minister of the gospel of Christ agreeable to your ordination agreements. I think I left out the word deportment. Uh, Maintain a deportment. That means live like what we were talking about today. Follow me as I follow Christ. Do you? Okay. So uh, because Josh is an assistant pastor, that means he's hired by the session, the elders of the church. So I'm going to ask any elders present if you will stand. This um, Josh's sort of mutual accountability goes back and forth with the elders. So to the elders, do you, the session of this congregation, continue to profess your readiness to receive Josh Kim, whom you've called to be your assistant pastor? Do you? And do you promise to receive the word of truth from his mouth with meekness and love and to submit to him in the due exercise of discipline? Do you? Do you promise to encourage him in his labors and to insist, assist his endeavors for your instruction and spiritual edification? Do you? And last, do you engage to continue in him while he is your pastor, that competent worldly maintenance, i.e. paycheck, which you have promised and to furnish him with whatever you may see needful for the honor of religion and for his comfort among you. Do you? Very good. Okay, I've got a, you can have a seat, elders. I've got a quick charge to Josh. Josh, um, every one of us in this room needs friends, but friends are especially essential for pastors. And you know this, not only because being a pastor can be isolating and lonely, but because loneliness and isolation can torpedo your ministry. And it can do horrible damage to the many precious sheep that Jesus bought with his own blood. So somebody needs to know you well enough to encourage you and also to remind you who you are, especially when you're walking out of line with the gospel. So my charge is that you'll keep cultivating your old friends that you have in many other cities, but you will also make more new friends here in Atlanta, here in this church, and especially make new friends who are also pastors. Last, I would say, keep those friends close for the sake of your own longevity and ministry, for the sake of the precious sheep that are allowing you to lead, and above all, for the honor of Jesus. Amen? Amen. So Josh has already been ordained. We don't have to lay hands on him and pray, but I do need to make this declaration. I now pronounce and declare that Josh Kim has been regularly installed as assistant pastor of this congregation Agreeable to the word of God and according to the constitution of the Presbyterian Church in America. And as as such, he is entitled to all support, encouragement, honor, and obedience in the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. I know I raced through that, but we are really thankful this man is here. So, yeah. You're good. Okay. So, uh, next slide, if we can go to that. This is Megan's turn. Hello. All right. Look, I don't have my notes on a fancy tablet, but they are no less important than what Walter just delivered. (laughs) Um, So, a year ago, we expanded into the entirety of this property, and we have been spending a lot of time over the course of the year um, reviewing where we have our elements of emergency response. I've provided some training for our staff, for some of our Sunday morning volunteers, and we thought this would be an excellent opportunity to further cast a net of knowledge with our congregation, um, just to familiarize yourself with the building, some of the resources that we have available, uh, should we need to respond to an emergency. Um, So up on this slide here is a diagram of our physical space. You will also find these located in the classrooms near many of the doors that enter into the classrooms. Um, To provide some orientation, this slide is opposite of how I think about our space, and perhaps that's the way for you as well. Um, But the gray box is the sanctuary. And so if you can land your eyes there, that's where we currently are. Um, The white heading towards 
well, heading inward towards me is heading towards West Side Kids. Um, so on this map, I know it might be hard to see where you're sitting, but if you actually look at one that we have printed on the walls, you'll notice that we have a coding, color-coded system for stars. Um, and I really don't expect anyone to memorize where things are, but just know that throughout the building, we have first aid kits, we have bleed kits, um, we have fire alarm poles, we have fire extinguishers, and we have a number of emergency exits. And so those are all highlighted with kind of a yellow path of where you are, what's your closest emergency exit. Um, so bringing that to everyone's attention just for the sake of, if we need to evacuate our building, um, we'll ask you to find the nearest exit. You'll know that we need to evacuate um, because our fire alarm is going off and you cannot miss it. It's very loud. Uh, it will be going off and it will be accompanied with directions to begin evacuating the building. Uh, those may come from the stage. They may come from an, um, an adult leader coming into a classroom space. Uh, and they'll notify everyone that we need to get out as quickly as possible. So the goal is to find the quickest exit, um, and I wanted to highlight in this space in particular, we have exits out this door, this door, the two back doors, and then also this front corner here. There is an exit that will immediately get you out of the building and down a pathway that can take you towards Collier. Um, and we need to utilize all of those exits to get everyone out of the space in a timely manner. Um, so just bringing some attention to where those exits are. Uh, with evacuation, one other thing I wanted to highlight, and this is really important for parents in the room. Um, if West Side Kids programming is occurring and there isn't a need for an evacuation, the staff and the teachers in West Side Kids will get our children out of the building. The absolute worst thing for a parent to do is to go interfere their processes. So you need to get out of the building, trust that another adult will have your child safely evacuated from our building, and we have a reunification point identified, which is our student center, and actually I have a slide when I talk about parking where I'll show you um, where on our campus that is located, but it's just um, on the other edge of our parking lot in the building right next door. We are renting a third of that space um, where our youth meet regularly, and if we need to evacuate, that's gonna be a reunification point for our families. So fight your desire to go claim your children from inside the building, but go outside the building to the student center um, to pick up your children. Okay, so that's kind of the overview of evacuation. I did want to highlight that over the last year, um, we have brought in professionals to train staff and key leaders um, should we have a, a scenario with an intruder threat or an active shooter. And so a lot of us have received an extensive training on this. Um, with the training came a security audit of our physical space. We've actually had a few uh, professionals on site to kind of look at our campus and identify where our vulnerabilities are, make recommendations for how we can minimize those. Um, one of the strongest pieces of feedback that came from that training was the need to buy time. Time is a very, very important component in um, an emergency scenario where you need to respond. Um, as you can imagine by looking at our space, one thing that limits our ability to have time is glass. And so we have identified some vulnerabilities like there's an entire glass wall in this room. Um, and we've put significant capital investment towards um, protecting those. So all of our exterior windows and doors have protective film application on them that make them um, more sturdy, less shatterable, and the ultimate goal being to provide more time for us to respond. There be an emergency. Um, so we have those on all of the exterior spaces. West Side Kids has additional um, protective film and framework, like a really significant defense system on the interior glass doors that kind of lead to the classroom space as well. Um, we felt it was really important for us to um, provide that level of protection should we need additional minutes to respond to a scenario on our campus. Um, we've also added additional security uh, footage on the exterior of our property um, and we're working we've added additional security coverage like physical personnel on Sunday mornings you may have noticed that that we have um, more staff present who are providing security services and we're working to add those to additional events throughout the week as we just have more people um, using this space a lot throughout the week and that's great and we just recognize some of the vulnerabilities that we have and we're working to address those. Um, so that's an update on emergency response. 
Next, gosh, I have all the fun updates. <laughs> parking. Um, I, we recognize that parking at Atlanta Westside is sometimes like a feat of strength and agility and requires a level of patience that the Holy Spirit may not have provided for you in the morning. Um, and so I have a few recommendations, um, and I actually would hope you hear those as like I'm strongly urging you to consider and act <laughs> in a few areas to um, help us with some of our parking woes. I want to first say we don't have a parking space issue yet. We average 30 to 40 vacant spaces every single Sunday, even when we have been at our fullest capacity. Um, so there are spaces that are available to us. I'm going to take a moment to highlight where some of those spaces are um, because it may take a shift in your uh, rhythm as you come in and you're thinking, where am I going to park, um, to know, like, hey, there's, there's opportunity that's untapped. We've got great potential. Uh, so looking at our campus map, and before I actually get deep into that, I will highlight for those of you who are looking for the student center. So the green building is this building. Um, the entrances are numbered there, and then the green third of the soiree building is our student center. And so that's the third that is closest to our property, um, is part of Atlanta Westside's campus. And so we have parking available in our primary lot. We have parking available next door in the soiree student center lot, a little further down the hill um, at Piece of Cake, and you'll notice they have, they have half of the lot available to us, so please be mindful of the signage there and park in the front half of their lot, but leave that back half available for um, their staff and perhaps purchase cake at the end of the day. Um, and then further down Collier, these are two lots I want to bring to everyone's attention. The Seat lot and Handcook Taqueria. Those are each a five minute walk. That is lot two lobby um, from our campus, so not far. You've surely walked further to go to a Braves game. You've walked further to go to class. Um, many of you can do this walk. Uh, there are always spaces available in those lots. So if you're coming, you're looking for parking, I guarantee those are spaces. And, and uh, when everybody's leaving the church and, and instead of being stuck in a car waiting to get out, you can just walk to your car and go right on your way. Yes, that's actually the next point I'm going to bring up. So <laughs> the issue we really have with parking is more around congestion and flow. We back up Collier pretty significantly, as many of you have probably experienced. Um, so if you park in those lots, as Walter said, yeah, you really avoid all congestion from a traffic perspective. You can skirt it completely. Um, even if you're not parking in those lots, although I, I really advocate using them, uh, if people are able to think about how they enter our campus from a traffic perspective, it would help the backup on Collier significantly if you kind of loop around and use Hills Avenue, DeFores Hills, or if you can come down Chattahoochee to Collier versus coming from the DeFore side to Collier because that's where we have just kind of a slow, long line. I've heard that we've even hit 75 with our backup before. And so that's pretty significant. And if people think about how they approach our campus, we can disperse the traffic flow. It would be really helpful. Um, and I'm asking you to do these things for two primary reasons. Um, one, we desperately need to have space in our primary lot for the people who need to be parking in our primary lot. That includes our families with young children. Um, strollers and toddlers walking down Collier is very complicated, and we need those families to be able to park in lots here on the main campus. Um, we also need to have space in the spirit of public faith for people who are visiting Westside, who may have never come to church, for those who may feel outside and unfamiliar. When they come to our campus and they can't even find a place to park and they're kind of directed down a hill, that's a really, really cold start to a morning for them. And so for those of us who are in this room and who are familiar with Westside and who've been coming for enough time to know how to find a parking lot and how to find an entrance, um, the difference that you can make in someone's experience on a Sunday morning is it's substantial. Um, that it cannot go like 
without acknowledgement. And so those are my two reasons to like really consider um, kind of spreading that parking out. If you're here volunteering, if you get here early, early is a reason to park further away. Not a, I got here early and I get the best spot. Um, you get here early, it means you have a little more time to get here. And so somebody who's had a tough morning and is getting here late can park a little closer and shorten the, the time gap that they're already experiencing on a Sunday morning. Um, so yes, those are my great big parking petitions. I think I've covered it all, and I know everybody's really here to hear about the budget. <laughs> well done. Thank you, Megan. Uh, great, we'll get into it. So we're gonna start with some higher level numbers. I'll, I'll cover those, and then Lauren will get into some of the weeds, and we'll answer questions after that. So our fiscal year, as a reminder, runs from August to July. So sort of more of a school year calendar. And so the good news is last year we were over budget on giving, came in just under $4 million. Um, what's really incredible about that is we were also able to raise $2 million in the capital campaign. So uh, the Lord definitely provided in, in amazing ways last year. Uh, next year, um, we're projecting a 12% increase in our giving and a 27% increase in our expenses. Um, those numbers may uh, not reconcile at first, but the good news is that's comparing to last year. We were over budget on giving, uh, which is like income, and under budget on expenses. So we're able to project a you know, more moderate increase uh, in income and then actually invest in some places more aggressively on the expense side. So uh, we can go to the next slide. This is just a little bit of a year-over-year -year view of, of income, which again is, is tithes and offerings. So you can see last year we, we took a pretty big step up and we're projecting about an 11% increase uh, next year. And we typically build our budget with more moderate increase, more like slight gains in the fall. We uh, typically see a big December spike as people put, uh, you know, give large gifts at the year end. Um, and then I'll project a little bit more aggressive growth in the spring as, as our membership sort of increases throughout the year. So. Uh, that's it for me, and Lauren, you can. Next slide. So to break down our expenses, we have five major categories that we track. Um, there are general administration, which is things like postage, very unexciting. Facilities, staff, giving, um, which is outside the church and within the church, and then programming. Um, that's everything from adult discipleship to children's, et cetera. Um, you can see year over year, um, we have only one decline, uh, and that's actually in programming. And it's not that we're doing less programming, it's that we continue to realize that we're able to do so much with very little. Um, so we've got room to grow that category, but we just haven't needed it yet. Um, obviously, the biggest category is staff as, as we continue to invest um, in the people of this church. Um, and we do, in fact, uh, are projecting a balanced budget. Um, we've yet to have one, but uh, we can always hope. Next slide. Um, for our reserves, we have um, two major categories that we track. The first one is operating. Um, we want to have 12 weeks of expenses covered in cash so that if literally <clears throat> everyone stops giving today, we can keep running the church for 12 weeks before we run out of money. It's obviously not going to happen, but that's the goal. Um, we also keep some money in facilities reserves, um, $200,000. Um, that seems like a lot of money, but this roof cost $200,000. So it's, it's, it's basically looking out for one major expense that we might not um, be anticipating. So you can see we're well over our targets um, because of the additional operating cash that we were able to bring in in fiscal year 24. Um, that does, that target does increase year over year because it's based upon our budgeted expenses, um, but we are still covering that target um, just because of excess cash raising. Um, I believe it's blocked on what I can see. Our debt is just under $3 million. So um, that is the debt that was used on this property to buy this building. It's been refinanced once, um, and it's actually a pretty great rate. We were able to refinance before rates really took off the last 18, 24 months. Next slide. That was it. All right. So we, uh, we wanted to leave time for questions, and uh, why don't we start with money questions so Chris and Lauren can step off if they want to and actually Megan could too if she wants. Uh, any questions about the budget, um, things related to dollars and cents? And we've got a mic there. Ray's got a mic for anybody that just raise your hand and he'll bring you the mic so that those watching the live stream later can 
know what your question was. Yes, dish over there, Ray, by the windows. The coated windows. <laughs> Is the increase in employee you know, the 2.2 to 2.4 million, is that in new hires or are staff getting a pay increase? Great question. Okay. Can we go back to slide, I think, 18? That's the breakdown. Um, so, yes, in fiscal year 24, we had budgeted for a new children's minister and an associate pastor, and obviously those didn't get hired probably almost exactly equally with the beginning of fiscal year 25. So there is additional hires that was in there. Um, I'll let Megan speak to any um, positions that we're currently still looking to fill. But yes, every year we have a whole personnel committee um, that works, men and women, works with the session on the total compensation package of our staff. Um, and I believe this year increases were between three and 5%, though we did have larger increases um, the prior year because of inflation. Okay. Um, yes, Lauren touched on it. It's both. It, it's for compensation for current staff and knowing that we are still understaffed and will need to hire additional staff. Um, some of the that is just kind of bucketed right now as that we know the needs will come and we're actually actively working to identify which are key positions to be hiring and filling in, um, in the course of this fiscal year. Yeah. So there will likely be open positions posted. And the, the known vacancies are permanent West Side Kids Director and Student Ministries Director presently. But other, other positions contemplated in the, in the fiscal year. Back there, Ray. And Louise. Um, hey, everybody. Thank you for this. Um, I wanted to ask about the reduction in the production, the program budget and just ask about the spirit behind it. I think it's great to be able to do more with less, but I'm just curious, knowing that our church has grown, that we're doing more programming than ever, are there sacrifices that have been made that maybe we shouldn't make for the sake of hospitality or quality of experience? Just want to know kind of the heart behind it. It's a, it's a great question, and, and to provide further clarification, the budget reduction actually reflects more accurate budgeting. So we were a little over budget in that particular category last fiscal year. So while it's not a cut in any programmatic expenses, it was a realization of, oh, we just budgeted more than we actually need to. Every single expense. ministry, adult, children, student, family, everything was double digits, like 27% under budget. So we had had some pretty generous increases in fiscal year 24 um, that didn't get actualized. We're hoping that, that this number will continue to increase as we get permanent staff in on the children's um, and youth side. Though, of course, Stephanie Holby on the children's side has permission to spend. And, and you guys might elaborate on this, or, or Bruce Terrell, our executive director, might as well, but um, with the the limitations of our facility, the, one of the main ways that we can serve and equip our people better is, is staff. So um, even if our programming budget hasn't gone up, our staff budget going up is, is uh, seeking to have a meaningful impact on, on how well we are serving and equipping the people. One other thing too, just to clarify, this is showing a budget versus a budget, and I think Lauren hit that. So our actuals, we, because our fiscal year still just ended, we're still like finalizing some of those, so it is a little misleading. In that. Not misleading, it's just showing you like year over year what we're planning for. Um, but to Lauren's point, we, we spent less in, in programming last year than we're projecting to spend this year. So there was an increase over actual, just not an increase over budgeted. That's helpful, thank you. You, you won't see any, you won't ever see somewhere and be like, wow, they really could have spent a little bit more here. <laughs> so I have a question, and forgive me if this has been covered in a meeting years ago, but I noticed we have, so we have $3 million in debt. How are we actively managing that? Where is that coming from the budget in terms of paying that down? Do we have a vision to kind of get rid of that eventually? Like what are, what are we planning in terms of that? 
So the loan is amortizing, so we're paying interest and principal on it. Um, I honestly can't remember what the original amount was, maybe three, four, or something like that. Um, so in just uh, a year or two, we've already paid down hundreds, you know, hundred thousand dollars or so. Thanks, Walter. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's being paid down because the bank's making us. But the bigger point is that when we have excess cash on these operating reserves, um, as a session they discuss what we want to do with excess cash. So the finance committee might make a recommendation. We haven't made any recommendations yet because we're still hovering pretty close to our targets. If we got to a place where we're, we're sitting on $2 million of cash instead of one and a half million, the finance committee would probably make a recommendation to the session to make a principal reduction of debt, a principal payment. Great answer. Any, anybody have any questions about emergency planning and um, parking stuff too? I will just say that the debt doesn't, um, doesn't give me angst or anything like that because while you're just seeing the reserves of our cash, the debt doesn't acknowledge the fact that this property has value to the church of, of significant amount. I just wanted hey, to Kate. get a point over here before a voice came out. Um, but I was wondering as far as the safety and parking and things like that, um, I felt like it was pretty helpful. Is that going to be like explained to the people who aren't here in some way or shared on a, I don't know. No, it's a great people. question, and it comes up every time we share information um, with a group of people. I think there is a strong desire for that information to be widely available. Um, this is one opportunity. We'll find additional opportunities to continue to remind people and to share information around the emergency resources that we have available. Yeah. Yes. Yes, oh, so what Bruce is saying is, now that you know, will you tell other people? <laughs> If you, if you guys want, if you don't have any more questions for them, they can have a seat, and I can stay up here in the hot seat if you want to ask anything else about the church, and I'll bat it down to an elder. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, y'all are welcome to have, to step down if you like. I know it's one o'clock, a lot of you have been here for a long time, but um, anything else on your mind you're curious about? Yes, Chip, or I'll give you the mic. It was nice to see an update on the nominations. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the first update since we were told to send in nominations. Mm -hmm. What was the process like to land on those? Candidates? Yeah, so uh, the, the elders spent, uh, well, first of all, we, we got, the, there's a massive amount of data, and everybody who submitted a nomination and the reasons for it, we're super grateful for that, but took a long time for us to work through that. Uh, the elders spent a long time betting every single nomination. Um, we came up with a sort of slate of recommended nominees. Then we asked each nominee to fill out a questionnaire just to get a sense for whether they were um, ready to move forward in the process. Those that filled out the questionnaires and were more or less ready to move forward, we said, okay, you ready to move forward, and now we're laying out the plans for the training, which Josh, Kim are uh, fully installed. Assistant pastor will be leading that training, and uh, that'll go start soon, uh, end before, or the first phase will end before December probably, or before Christmas at least, and then we'll have some more training in the spring before we're ready to, to put those new uh, lay leaders in place. Um, so that's, and, and, uh, and like I said, the, those, the way, the way we're working with our church uh, polity is elders uh, must be elected and ordained uh, so that we, once those people have gone through training and are, if they want to keep going forward, they'll be uh, put before the congregation to be elected or not. And then the session, the elders will commission the diaconal ministry team and the women's council directly right around the same time. 
that raise any questions for anybody? What's the difference between the diaconal ministry team and the women's council? Yeah, big difference. Thanks. So the, the diaconal ministry team is what we have been calling the diaconate, or we have been calling them deacons, but our denomination uh, passed a change to our, our book of church order this summer that uh, does not allow us to do that. So this is our, our best effort to uh, submit to that and to our own conscience under scripture before the Lord. Uh, so they're, they're basically doing the same work, uh, but we're just calling them a different name. Uh, the Women's Council is a new group that uh, has a, a handful of purposes. One of them, and hopefully we've, we've communicated this in other places, uh, one of them is to be just a, a, a body that meets, I think we've said initially, even just twice a year, hopefully, hopefully more often, maybe quarterly, maybe even more, that considers what are the particular needs of women in the church, what are the, um, who are some of the women leaders in the church that need support and encouragement to identify. Uh, we're going to build them up and network with them. Uh, another key purpose of the Women's Council is to send at least two representatives to every meeting of the session. So that, like, interestingly, Lauren Johnson is like the one veteran of our session meetings. She's been to more session meetings than any other woman. And anybody can come, by the way. We meet monthly. But um, we want to make sure that the voices of women are, are sitting there at, at every session meeting. And we're inviting their, their input as we um, seek to lead the church. And then uh, within that, each member of the Women's Council is, we want them to have a lot of flexibility in terms of their particular sort of... Uh, billet is the word I'm thinking of, their particular job description. They may serve in different areas of the church uh, in very extensive ways, uh, so they'll, they'll have kind of a different profile depending on what their ways of serving in the church are, but those are the two main things that they'll be doing together, sort of gathering together to investigate what are the needs of women and how can we encourage other women leaders in the church, and then how can we send representatives to, to provide voices of women in the session. And that, that, yeah, I already said the document ministry team. You guys know what that is, yeah. And that has m women and men on the DMT. We don't have to stay here for a long time, but people usually have some little burning question that, that it helps to talk about. I wanted to go back to the evacuation plan and safety plan. Mm -hmm. um, by the way, great job on this space. I am very proud to see this and and happy to hear about the safety we put in place in this building. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask more so about the student center. Do we have plans in place for safety for active shooters that might happen there, an evacuation plan there? I'll get you a mic. Um, yes, we do have plans for the student center that look very similar to the plans here. There are evacuation routes, and there have been um, upgrades to the glass doors on that property as well. Mm -hmm. Hang, yeah, thanks. Stay nearby, Megan. <laughs> I, just to say this, I, I'm surprised nobody has asked, uh, asked about whether we intend to buy the building next door. The, the short answer is... We haven't decided that. We still have an option to buy it as we are, are leasing it currently. Uh, but we, we are just beginning a strategic planning process that will map out some larger questions like that over the next three to five years. Um, Bruce Terrell, our executive director, raise your hand, Bruce. He's the guy to ask questions about that. Um, that's, gonna, that's involving lay leaders and a third-party consultant but we want our, our facilities decisions to not be driven by like, oh, do, you know, do we have the money? Is it for sale and all that as much as like, where are we going as a church? So, so Lord willing, by this, before this time next year, we're, we're going to be sharing with you much more about where we think the Lord is leading us as a church. And this time next year, maybe even have some other big decisions made too. All right, I feel like you guys want to get out of here unless somebody going once. All right, let me pray and we'll go. Uh, Lord Jesus, we give you all the praise and glory that we exist at all, that we belong to you, 
that we get the privilege of worshiping and serving you together. Uh, please glorify your name by making Atlanta West Side a, a little bit clearer reflection of your gracious heart for us and for the whole world. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for sticking around, guys.